It's hard to put into words how unheard of this was. At least in the Bible Belt in America, the way that church happened was in beautiful buildings that were tied to denominations. The idea of someone meeting in an abandoned grocery store, there was no grid for that. And when people would hear, we're starting a non-denominational church and it was gonna be called Antioch, they would look at you at like you were an alien. It would make you pause and think, are we crazy? Like, is this thing actually gonna work? Thinking like, are, are we gonna get paid? Is anyone actually right. gonna come? Or is there gonna be anyone that shows up? Just wondering. When the opportunity came um, for us to plant, the question was, does Waco, Texas need another church? And the answer was no. But. Waco, Texas needs a church planning church. And so we launched out, you know, uh, just with that ambition. What if we actually really lived out the kingdom? What if we really invested in people's lives? And what if we became a church planning church that, again, was built on multiplying everything that we did here and around the world? When we found out that Antioch was going to be planted, I'm not a big risk taker. I'm not always looking for the latest thing, but Man, something jumped inside me, and I knew we are to be part of that. Big things require big faith, um, and something about it felt like crazy faith. But internally, I knew, like, we got to do this, and, and I want to be a part of it. It really was exciting. It really made us family. One time I was talking to Jimmy, and I said, what if we put all our eggs in this basket, and then it doesn't work? Like this thing goes belly up. I'll never forget, he just looked at me and said, well then, we will have known that we gave everything for the purpose of Jesus and others, and I'd rather do that than play it safe. to have a desire to become a people, right? A family. And we had that in our hearts. We want to walk with these people for the rest of our lives. We want to build these people into people that can change the world. We wanted to do it together and then reproducing that around the world. We did not want to just build another great church. Our hope was that we would really be a part of a move of God. From the really the earliest days, we were a nomadic people in the sense that we were a community of people called together, committed to walking together, um, trying to love each other and love God as best we can, but we didn't really have a physical home. Um, so um, every Sunday, we were rotating different locations around town. I remember walking in um, and feeling so much excitement. It was electric in the room. Um, and it smelled like um, a combination of beer and cigarettes and manure. And yet everyone's eyes were just lit up. Every week, was a challenge because there was so much work to do to put everything together. And But I think everybody felt like we, we were planting a church. Really, nobody came to church just to spectate. Right. They walked in know, knowing I have a part. As a kid, it was exciting of, we don't know where we're going to be going to church that week, and we don't know who will be with us and who's going to show up. We had... Uh, sound issues, sound problems, and yet through all of that, when the first chords were strummed, there was just a lift in the room. All of our hands are raised and our eyes are lifted to heaven, and the worship was so real. And it was from that first service I knew. Um, this is crazy and this is ragtag, but this is my family. We knew that God wanted us to have a place that we could call our own, um, a campus to draw people to, to train them. So when we bought the uh, abandoned grocery store cafeteria, it was quite a project. But for 
say 500 people, uh, that was a large amount of money just to sacrificially give to even get planted in the city. While we were raising the money, renovating the building and moving around town, eventually we were like, hey, why don't we just meet on the parking lot? I loved the parking lot services. It was okay going around to other places, but when we could all gather, bring their lawn chairs, some of the Baylor students would bring the couch. The band was on that flatbed trailer, but uh, it was such a joy to be, you know, uh, putting down roots in this neighborhood. We had a biblical conviction that uh, we didn't want to be going into debt to see this building built or just operate as a church, period. There was uh, one week where the bills were due. We needed $153,000 in 24 hours. It was a lot of fun uh, seeing uh, kids walk in with their piggy banks to our office across the street um, Monday morning. Um, people sell things, you know, in a short amount of time to bring cash. Um, and in the end, at noon, we had the $153,000. We had a table in the back labeled tithe when we were meeting out on the parking lot before the building was done. And I remember TVs being on there and mink, mink coats. And it was like people were just bringing everything they had instead of just money, because some people didn't have money. I remember the day that finally it was announced, all right, we the city allowed us to get inside this building. And I think I was overwhelmed with the culmination of it in that building, seeing dreams and visions and things talked about coming true. Also then, little did I know, it was a time we were gonna get tested. We were getting to walk into a testing time. All right, let's see what's gonna happen now, God. We're driving home from vacation, actually, and it's August 2nd, and we get the phone call. Heather and Dana have been picked up by the Taliban, and immediately I just called uh, back, and I said, call all the life group leaders, set up 24-hour prayer, let's go. That night, I came in with my sleeping bag, and um, man, I, uh, yeah, it's just prepared to be up all night, not knowing how long this would last, and uh, the prayer room was filled. Our whole church really did respond. We were meeting all the time to pray and intercede. I ended up going over there thinking I would be gone a week or two and was gone almost exactly 11 weeks. I literally learned to stand on the Word, praying like crazy every day. Whenever people have to rally together uh, to see God come through in an impossible situation, something happens and pulls us together. And we became such a people during that time. So it was really exciting when he, we got the call that, that Dana and Heather had been released and there was gonna be a worship service. So we all got in our cars and went to church. It's so exciting and just, Sweet to see the fruit of all of our prayers answered. Everybody, I knew everybody was going to congregate, you know, here, and such celebration. The worship that happened was all very spontaneous um, because there was no time to prepare for it. We, we didn't even have an hour to figure out what was going on. I remember thinking, God, what's on your heart right now? And him saying, what's on Dana and Heather's heart right now? When I heard him say that, I just started singing, Jesus loves Afghanistan. After being in Islamabad with them and a debriefing, I'm flying back a week later, I'm gonna preach on Sunday morning. And I said, God, what do I speak on after all this has happened? And the Holy Spirit speaks to me, tell the congregation to return to their first love. And I was like, Lord, that sounds like a rebuke, right? And he was like, no, 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 no. Just remind them that we're not the Heather and Dana church. We're not the church that saw the girls in Afghanistan delivered. We're the church who love Jesus, who love others, who love the lost. Call everybody back to simplicity of loving Jesus because I've got more than one mission for this community. I've got a mission for them to change the world and change lives locally, nationally, and internationally. One of the most important parts of our church life here has been that it's been about family. It's not been about the adults, but it's been 
a place where we could pull our kids in and, and let them be a part of this vision too. This led us to taking our family and three other families to Haiti, eight adults and 16 kids. And it was very much a place where the kids had their part. And I really, this was a foundation for them learning to share the gospel and, and love the lost and, and see the hurting and broken of the world. And the kids really took ownership of the process. They were in the dramas, they were in the dances, and it was just really fun to watch them seeing this, not just the adults that are the ministers, but they were able to be a part of the ministry to the people of Haiti. It made me go back to school and watch what a classic sixth or seventh grader was worrying about. And it helped me realize there's more to life than this. There are people out there that generally don't have a meal to eat. They don't have shoes, they don't own anything. It marked all of us. I just remember coming back and thinking, I can never be the same. When the tsunami hit, um, just so many people in our congregation and our leaders were like, we've got to do something. We can't just watch this on TV. I was actually on a hunting trip with my friend Robert Herber, who told me about the massive destruction that had hit. He looked at me and said, how can we not go? We gotta go. Our church had mobilized literally within minutes to get emergency aid and supplies and uh, medical personnel college students and immediately we were able able to bring counseling helps and medical helps and then just started doing the work of trying to get a village started there so our first wave we took um, was a medical team because that was the highest need and went in and just hit the ground doing whatever we could and it was amazing because we literally were able to build a village and we had long-term teams that stayed there for several years just really seeing the people get back on their feet when i think about being ready for crisis i think about all the decisions we make along the way uh, when we go on these short-term trips the spring breaks or when we take families to Haiti, those uh, small trips prepare us for the big things that God's gonna do in and through our lives. And so as a community, we've always made, made these short-term trips available so that when the big things happen, the Sri Lankas of the world or a, a refugee crisis in Europe or whatever it is that comes our way, we've got a prepared people. Right when we came to Sri Lanka, um, uh, outreach was going on and so many people were going to Indonesia and to different parts of the world. And it was just reach the world, reach the world, reach the world. But at the same time, I was hearing about like these college students let this homeless guy live on their couch. And I was seeing people was getting their family members to come and be a part of the Grace House of the Mercy House. And wow, it was just this beautiful mixture of reaching the world, but we were also reaching our city. You know, I wanted to see uh, not just one type of person or not just one type of ministry, but every type of person and every type of expression and every type of gifting all mixed together. And that's definitely what was happening. Life for a long time was very dark of drugs and chaos and brokenness and pain. Um, I had gotten to a point where I was so broken that I had cried out to God and asked him for his help. The next day, <laughs> an answered prayer, I was given the opportunity to go to jail. <laughs> when I was fixing get, to get released, um, there was a pastor there. He had asked me, he said, Jason, um, when you get back home, do you got a church you're going to go to? I was high one day. Um, I came across this house on a Halloween outreach. And I remember when I came up to his house, this guy came and talked to me and he prayed for me. and he told me he was from Antioch, and so uh, he invited me to come, but I never went. Fast forward two years, here I am about to get released. When I'm trying to think about a church I'm gonna go to, I remember Antioch. Didn't know what to expect, you know? I wasn't I wasn't a church goer. Um, I start looking around for somewhere to sit, and um, I'm with my son, and that's when I saw this family kind of motion and wave over to me and ask me if I wanted to sit with them. Afterwards, Jim and Amy said, hey, well, we got this group that's meeting tonight. It's called Life Group, and we'd love for you to come. Like I said, sure, I'd, I'd love to come, but I, I don't have a car. And they said, hey, we'll, we'll come and pick you up. And Jim and Amy started to come pick me up and take me back to this life group. As we started to see our lives get restored, and we were involved in a, in a life group, and we became members of the church, and we had people just really come around us and 
really love us and really just walk with us. You know, we were very strategic when we planted the church in this neighborhood. Addiction is a big problem in all communities and it was very much a, a problem in our community here. So we opened the Mercy House, which is amazing. And then we have Grace House, which has been operating for 10 years and they've seen many women just recover their lives, be restored to their families. I heard about Mercy House, which is um, the men's recovery home that we have in Antioch. We started to have the guys that were in the program come over to our house on Sunday night for dinner. And then I started to go over there and do Bible studies and, and start you know, walking with some of the guys. And a few years later, I was invited to join the staff over there. One of the biggest needs that we saw in our community was through our school district here, Waco Independent School District. And some studies came out that showed that if a student could get on reading grade level by grade three, then the trajectory of them being able to graduate from high school to get out of poverty is incredibly high. And so we started STARS Mentoring Project with using volunteers from our congregation just to go read 30 minutes a week and it would get the students on grade level. So now we are in 13 schools and we have hundreds of volunteers reading with the students and we expect it to make a tremendous difference. From the beginning, we've had this promise out of Isaiah 54, 2 and 3, that we would go deep and wide and spread out to the nations of the earth. And as we got to capacity here in our building and actually we're at four services and everything was packed out, we knew that God was saying it's time to expand. God was speaking, move forward, put a stake in the ground because I have something deep and wide that I want to do in and through this people. Before we move forward with that, we really wanted to make sure the congregation got to speak into that. So as we met in groups uh, and received feedback from people, really what surfaced from that time is not fear about the price tag or concern over the look of the building. What they were the most concerned about was the arch. While the arch was just an architectural structure that held the sign for the grocery store that was here before us, it had become a promise to us, just like he had put a rainbow over the people in the past in the Bible and there was a place of protection and they would start a new world, that for us, this arch would be a gateway to the nations. When we started construction on the new building, we had amazing engineers literally take it up off the roof and put it on the front of the property. So now actually what you walk through today, what we walk through today is the actual arch that was on top. You know, it really became for us a symbol of God's promises that God was going to do something in Waco that was going to be sent to the nations. And we're seeing that from the beautiful people of our Spanish ministry, to the international students that come to Waco, Texas, to the people who leave our doors and go out to the nations every single summer to reach people around the world. We're seeing that a gateway to the nations is happening. Ultimately, nobody gets the credit mm -hmm. for Antioch Community Church but Jesus. Yeah because there's so many people who've risked everything to see this church be what it's called to be. I love the fact that um, here at Antioch, we don't have to be any certain whatever. Just use what you have and bring that to the table. And we're reaching just the, the local community with the little that we each have. Mm -hmm. He's worthy of our lives, whether we're qualified or not. And my prayer is that our generation would know you don't have to be perfectly qualified. You don't have to have everything put together before you see God move. I've watched so much change over the few, these last years. The faces have changed, the style of music has changed, the building has changed. But I think that simple Yes to God is the thing that has remained the same. You don't have to be some superstar Christian to be a part of what God's doing here, that He really has a call in each of our lives to just take that next yes. We've always had a big vision. He's called us to reach our city and our neighbors and our friends. He's called us to reach our nation by planting churches that the glory of God may be seen in every state and every location in our nation. He's called us to the nations, those who've never heard. We partnered with him and he has done incredible things. But as we sought God the last couple of years, God, what's the next hill? He said, prepare to reach a billion people. But it's never been about the numbers. It's been about family the Antioch family, the people of God, never perfect, but always surrendering, never knowing maybe what the next step is, but always saying yes, because our yes is what creates the grace of God for that next adventure that he has us on. 
Whether you've been with us from the beginning or you just walked in the room, we're inviting you to join us to say yes again to all that God has for us because he's called us to be a people who have a passion for Jesus and his purposes in the earth.